Uh, we started this morning. We'll go ahead and read our, our main foundation text for our teaching. Uh, Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are where? In the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You know, in other words, you'll eat the fruit of life or eat the fruit of death. And um, I know somebody told me one time, that's God's mouth. That's not what it says. It says death and life in the power of the tongue. It didn't say if it was God, it just said it was specified, God's tongue. It's in the power of anybody's tongue. What you say is what you get. Amen? And so we talked about this morning some things. And, and um, so let's just go ahead. We'll pick up where we kind of left off. We're in the middle of, of talking about blessing and evil. It's our choice. Um, we talked about, you know, if you don't get the right words or the right information into your spirit or you get your, stu your, um, your storehouse of, of, um, in your spirit from the right place, you're going to say the wrong thing. In other words, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you put in abundance is what you get in. Now, we used to have an old computer um, acronym, and it was G-I-G-O. You know, everybody would bang on the computer and say, dumb computer and stupid computer if you got wrong results. But we always had a, you know, if, if the program was written right, and uh, you got bad results, so like, you know, we just started saying G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. You know, we had the best programs in the world. Um, slick, cool programs. I mean, fancy programs. But if you put the wrong data in, you're going to get the wrong data back out. So we called it guard. So whenever, whenever the uh, people who didn't like what the results were, what came out of the, uh, out of the system or whatever, we just say G-I-G-O. You get your operators to enter the data correctly, and you won't have a problem. They didn't like that. They always wanted to blame the computer, the, the programmer. Well, you know, we can't fix it if you put in the wrong stuff. Amen. And, and you know, I'm going to be honest with you. People run off and blame God all the time when they've been putting the wrong stuff in. Hello? If you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage. You can't put wrong data in and get right results. It just doesn't work that way. Hello? How many of you ever seen, you know, like, um, now math teachers deal with this all the time. If, if a student is doing a problem, they can do all the right steps, but somewhere along the way, uh, have a brain cramp or something, or brain freeze. Maybe they were drinking a cheer wine slush and the brain froze while they were doing something. And they, they transposed a number or something. They did something like that. Guess what they're going to have at the end of the problem? The wrong answer. It doesn't matter that they, that they did all the steps right. If they put it, you know, what I mean, right, you know, in other words, they followed, they followed the, the steps. They, they divided this by the top number, the bottom number. They did the exponents correctly. They, they followed the formula. But they, if they transpose a number or something, they're going to have the wrong data. Christians have to understand if you put the wrong stuff in, you're not going to get the right stuff out. It just it doesn't, it, well, it just doesn't matter. It does matter. I said it does matter. What you put in does have a relationship or a direct correlation to what you get out. Um, Psalm 19, 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be wholly acceptable, O Lord, thy my strength and my redeemer. That's kind of where we left off this morning. Psalm 119, verse 15 says this, uh, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto all thy ways. The verse, 11th verse of the same chapter says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh, that's a good one. Look, just go on over there. I want you to see it in your Bible. You can't, you, you, some of you don't, don't believe me. I don't want you to be like the people who in the past said, I didn't believe you, Pastor Ed, when you said such and such. You know, send me emails later. I didn't believe you. But there it is. Let's take a look in your Bible. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We talked about this morning how the Word of God is life. And that if you'll put life in you, you'll get life out. If you'll put God's Word in you, it'll, help, it'll keep you from sin. Amen. Sin, see, overcoming sin is not a matter of just sheer willpower. It's a matter of putting the right things in that empower you to overcome. Now, we would call this, you know, God's Word that, that keeps us from sinning and God's Word that keeps us from, from losing. You could call that strengthening grace. It strengthens you in a way that keeps you from sin. But you still got to, you, you've got action to do. You've got to put it in. Grace is not applicable out of the, by osmosis. You just don't, it just doesn't happen to you. You receive God's grace by being a proactive participator in the things of God. Amen? All right, now look, 
it's Sunday night. Some of y'all just got up from your nap. You got to church. But I'm going to make you do the hokey pokey if you don't smile. We're going to make you stand up, put your left foot in, and all that stuff. All right? So who's here? Now smile. Yeah, Janice. Janice is, yeah, he's, I ain't doing no hokey pokey. All right. <laughs> Verse 15, I will meditate upon my precepts, have respect unto all thy ways. Verse 97, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And let me say this, as a believer, you should love the Word of God. Amen. I was thinking about this because a, a pastor that, I've, that we've, we've gotten to know each other over Facebook, he pastors down in Louisiana, and... Um, and, and I like this guy. He's, he's really, really, he's a simple of God pastor. He's a really neat guy. And uh, he posted something. He's going to be doing a teaching on, you know, the extremes of grace. And I hit like and I got back. And something, you know, he, he, he commented, I knew Pastor Ed Taylor would be with me on this one. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he must have been listening to me. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I don't know why I was going to tell you about him. I was going to tell you something about him. Well, we'll just get to it later on. Amen. Oh, 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 and so when he said that, I got to thinking about some things. If, you know, because I had a, um, I had an inner, an, an encounter, blogging Facebook encounter a couple of years ago, somebody on, on Facebook about grace, the, 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 the Looney Tune, Looney Tune stuff, you know, and they posted, oh, now that I'm under grace, I don't have to go to church. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to give. I don't have to obey. I don't have to submit. I, I mean, this went on with all this litany of stuff they don't have to do anymore. And I got to thinking about that uh, yesterday as I was just, just after that comment kind of sparked something in me and thinking about that particular conversation. And then I thought, you know, if you're a born again believer, you want to go to church. You want to tithe. You want to give. You want to submit. You want to obey. Hello? Not, it's not a get out of, you know, listen, it's not a get out of jail free card from Monopoly. Hello? Or Graceopoly or whatever you want to call it. You understand? If you really love the Lord, you're going to want to go to church. How do you know? What the psalmist said, I was glad. When they said, let us go up into the house of the Lord. Then you get these people, well, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> there, there are figurative things in the Bible that don't mean don't go to church. Just because we're, you know, the Bible talks about that in, in reference to, you know, the Spirit of God dwelling in you. But you're not the whole church by yourself. Yeah. Amen. And Paul went on and said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. We should want to be around other Christians. We should want to bring our finances and tithe, our, our giving and our offerings and our tithe to the house of God, to the things of God. We should want to obey. You know, I don't have to obey. Well, the Bible, well isn't that interesting? The Bible said, obey those with the rule over you. I don't have to obey. Obey those with the rule over you. Now, how do you get to not do what the Bible says when it tells you to do it? You know? See, if you love God and you love his word, here the, the psalmist says, I love thy law. I love thy word. I, it's my meditation all the day. It is dangerous, it is dangerous to, like we said this morning, we'll say, we're going to keep saying these things because we, we're, we're living in a time where people are, are weird. They're, there's messed up. There's messed up teachings. There's messed up believing. There's messed up practices. And people are out there running around expecting certain things to happen, and they're not operating according to what the Word of God says to operate, or how the Word of God says to operate, to get those things to happen. Amen. And so, you know, they're, they're, they're living in a dream world. Now, I'm not talking about doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. I'm going to tell you something. If God tells you to do something, and you don't see the results you want, but you're obeying and doing what God told you, that's not insanity. Because I, I, whenever I use that definition, I always want to say, well, what about the children of Israel when they marched around the walls of Jericho? They kept doing the same thing over and over again. Until, until God told them a different instruction. Amen. Then something else happened. But you know, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different results is insanity. No, if, it's, if you're doing what God told you to do, and you're doing it over and over again, and that's what God told you to do, you're, you're in obedience. Thank you for your enthusiasm. All right. Now, we talked about this morning, we were getting through, we were kind of getting into this, but let's go back over to Deuteronomy, and let's get into chapter 30. Uh, about how blessing and evil is your choice. Remember we talked about the corruptible seed, the incorruptible seed, how that words are corruptible or they are incorruptible. 
We get words from one of two places. We get them from the kingdom of light or we get them from the kingdom of darkness. There's not a purgatory kingdom. There's not, there's just not some in-between kingdom. All right? So the words are either going to come out of the, the realm of darkness or the realm of light. Or the realm of life or the realm of death. What you connect with or how you connect to those kingdoms is done through your words. So if you're connecting to a kingdom through def the words of de defeat, darkness, and death, and you're, getting, and you're not getting life results, duh. Hello? Amen? So Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 10 through 16 says this. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his statutes and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. For this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that we should say who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. If, I, if in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and judgment, his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither, so, uh, whither thou goest to possess it. Now, doesn't that sound like a New Testament passage? Kind of over there in, um, you know, Romans. Y'all remember, remember that one? Romans at 10? Look over there. You can kind of, kind of hold your place here. We may run back over here. We may not, but just you know, maybe think, stick your little doohickey thing. Anybody know what a doohickey is? Does anybody know what a doohickey is? Well, in this particular case, it's this little, this little thing that marks a Bible, Bible marker. In, in this case, it's a doohickey. All right. But look at Romans 10. Glory to God. They didn't use the Old Testament when they preached. Is that amazing? Are y'all here? You're going home. They didn't have scriptures when they preached. That's what somebody said, because trying to say that we didn't, we didn't need the Bible, because when they preached the Old New Testament, they didn't have a Bible. Is that right? Let's just start in verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God to, for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And he is re technically referring to here them going about to try and establish their righteousness with the law instead of doing it through faith in Jesus Christ, and they've missed God's righteousness by doing it. You know, Jesus has come. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, saying, The man that doeth them shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. Wow. Sounds just like Deuteronomy 30, doesn't it? And, and then he goes on and brings New Testament revelation to this. That is, bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep. Again, he adds New Testament revelation. That is, bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh unto thee. Now, in the Old Testament, it said, the word is nigh unto thee, even in the mouth and in the heart. Amen. He goes on and says, in the mouth and in the heart. And then he gives a description of it. That is the word of faith which we preach. So Deuteronomy was saying something about, you know, and he says, and, and then he goes on and says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Amen. Now, if that doesn't sound like Deuteronomy chapter 30, I don't know what does. Amen. And notice now, Deuteronomy 30, he says, I've set before you blessing and cursing life or death. Here he says, you know, that um, he says, he says this, he, he says, um, that whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Acting on the word. Now, let's, notice he says that the word is not far off. In the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, the word's not in heaven. It's not below the earth. It's not out in the sea. It's not, it, it, it's in your heart. It's right there. Now, th now, the Old Testament says this, it's in your heart that you may do it. Well, that's, you know, listen, you understand this. Paul's quoting that with the understanding they know the whole context. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
He's, he's quoting from a passage of Scripture. He's not uh, doing away with all the words he didn't use. He's just bringing it into New Testament revelation. That this confession is the confession of the Lordship of Jesus. It is confession of faith. It's, the, it's faith in your heart that comes out of the Word of God. Because he goes on in this uh, same chapter. I mean, actually, uh, uh, <laughs> glory to God, hallelujah. And talks about how that, um, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. And so, he, he's, you know, he, he begins to talk about, if you read this, he also gets in verse 12, says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, so we, we can't go this just for the, Jew, the Jews. But well, Paul made it for the Greeks. Understand he's talking about putting the Word in your heart. The Word's not going to be out here somewhere else. It's not going to be over there somewhere else. When you feed on the Word of God, it's in you that you may do it. And you know what Joshua 1.8 says? See, we begin to see... There are patterns in the Word of God. There are principles in the Word of God. And, and, when, and, they, and they stay consistent throughout the Word of God. People get all caught up with the law. That we're not under the law. Well, you know, remember this. The Bible says the law was added 430 years after the promise. There were principles they were operating in way before the law got there. That's why I like to say this, because people say, you know, tithing's under the law. Yeah, and it was before the law too, honey. You study the Scripture, tithing was a part of Abraham's walk, and that was in the, when he was under promise. So I say this, tithing was before, during, and after the law. What is it that the law added that we are not to follow after? Ritualistic practices. Amen. You don't follow after sacrifices of ritualistic sacrifices in order to get things from God. You don't take a turtle dove, you don't take a meal offering, you don't take a trespass offering. We don't have to take a sin offering or a trespass offering when we miss the mark. We just confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's been replaced. You know, we don't, we don't bring lambs in every year to stay the, the wrath of God and, and, and at Passover. Jesus is our Passover. He is our Paschal Lamb. Amen. He died, he entered in once and for all with his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, let me say this. That eternal redemption is, that redemption is eternal. Redemption is eternal. But if you ain't walking in it, you don't get it. Hello? In other words, it's not a, it's not a yearly sacrifice. It, it's, it's perpetuated. As long, as long as you come into the kingdom, and confess him as Lord, and walk in accordance with him, and don't, don't come to the place like Hebrews uh, 6 tells us, where you tread underfoot the blood of the Son of God, to count the blood of the covenant, wherewith you were sanctified, an unholy thing, it's eternal for you. But you can tread underfoot the blood of the Son of God. And the Bible says after that, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. People, come, people just don't read the Bible. I said, people just don't read the Bible. You know, once saved, always saved. Well, what are you going to do with Hebrews 6? I I'm sorry, what are you going to do with it? W where are you going to put that? Is that going to go over there with the other Bible that doesn't have 1 John 1 and 9 in it? Because it doesn't line up with your theology? The Bible says you can tread underfoot the blood of the covenant, blood of the Son of God, wherewith you were, 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 were sanctified. And then it says, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. That's it. Okay. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <clears throat> so Paul's talking about law righteousness. Now understand the law after the promise given to Abraham. Amen. There are things throughout the Word of God that are just biblical principles of how things work. The law of seed time and harvest is, is how things were created. Your words are seed. They bring a harvest. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that's still true. So stop discounting everything that comes before the book of Acts and saying that's Old Covenant. Because you got people saying well, what Jesus said was under the Old Covenant actually, so I don't have to obey that. I've heard people say it. That's where they are now. Because Jesus said some stuff that doesn't line up with their extreme teachings. And so, they, well, what Jesus said, that if he was really an Old Testament ministry, we're under the new. He knew the new was coming. Hello? And he still said it. 
Hello? <laughs> Dear Lord, help your, help your darling head, heart and stupid head. My, 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 my. I mean, he could have at least gone, well, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to tell you this, but honestly, it ain't going to matter after I go to the cross. So, you know, it's only three and a half years. This is only a three and a half year commitment to this particular statement. After that, you got the whole new thing. Paul's coming. He's going to tell you everything you need to know. What I said doesn't matter anymore. That went over big. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Peter, James, and John, don't listen to those guys. I know they're the big three, but I'm the big dog. I'm the one with all the revelation. I'm on a soapbox right now because somebody else recently just came out and said, don't, listen, don't read Peter, James, and John because Paul, they disagree with Paul about grace, and he's the one that had the revelation. Wow. Sounds like you've been smoking some spiritual wacky weed. Hallelujah. Now what said the word is neither even in thy mouth and in thy heart. It is the word of faith which we preach. You don't have to go looking for it all over. Just, just get into the word. Feed on the word. It gets in you. Paul says it produces faith. We're to live that way. We're to speak those things. We're to speak things full of faith. Amen. Amen. We sp people spend more time trying to teach people how not to do the Bible because it sells books and sells videos and gets them popular than teaching them how to live victoriously. If you want to live victoriously, be a doer of the Word. I said, if you want to live victoriously, be a doer of the Word. Stop looking for ways out. I'm going to tell you something. Now, now in the charismatic word of faith circles, you know, you, we, we also call, re, refer to as neo-Pentecostals and that kind of thing, although I did grow up classical Pentecostal. Um, we got people who bring a bad report on us. Come here. Did y'all know what I'm saying? Eight. What did I miss there? Oh, he gives me an eight on that. Oh. How many will give me a ten on that catch? Uh, I got, I see, I, uh, you outnumbered, Larry. Look at, look at James 1. We'll just start in verse, oh... 16, do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth that we should be uh, first fruits of his creations. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, now stop. Who's James talking to? James 1, 1. James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting my brethren. Who's talking to? The Christian, the, at this point in time, the Jewish Christian church. And he says this, wherefore lay apart. I'm under grace. Well, why, well, why, well, if you, well, listen, all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls, not your spirits. The word here is suke, it is not pneuma. The Greek word is not pneuma, which is your spirit. It is suke, which is the soul. So he's not talking about getting born again. See, your spirit gets born again. When you're, when you're born again, your spirit's born again, your soul is not. We renew our minds. And the word save here, you know, it's, it's sozo, but it doesn't, sozo doesn't mean, it has, has a broader meaning than, than the one meaning of spiritual salvation for your spirit. It also is a, a word that, that covers restoration, wholeness, soundness, prosperity, uh, healing, physical healing. It's, a, it's an all-inclusive word. So here... Receive with meekness the regret the word of God which is able to sozo or restore your suke. He's talking to believers. He's not talking about getting born again. He's talking about restoring your soul. 
or as, as um, Romans 12 tells us, amen, it says that the, um, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the renewing of your mind, amen, that you may prove is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Be not, be not conformed to this world, be transformed. Now, I'm not going to do a great long teaching on this. The word, the word there in Romans 12, where it says, be not conformed means to be fashioned, molded, shaped according to the world. But transform is metamorpho, metamorphosis. The soul of the, 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 the suke of man does not get born again. It gets metamorphosed. How? Through the renewing of your mind, by the washing of the word of the word, feeding on the word of God. It saves. Here James gives it clarity. It says, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to, and this kind of tithe over there with Romans, which is able to what? Transform your soul. That's what he's talking about. Engrafted word is able to save your soul, but the Greek words here line up and give you the picture of, of a restoration of the soul. And that comes from feeding on the, what? The engrafted word. Amen? The engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But listen to this. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, what? Deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and what we talked about this morning and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Oh, that's an ugly, that's a cuss word. That's a four letter word used in church. Work. We get, listen, <clears throat> people, in, at least in this country, people are so conditioned to get something without n doing nothing. Lose 50 pounds and never get off your couch. You see it on television. Buy the electric shocker. It'll tone you. You'll have rock hard abs in six weeks. And they show some guy who's done 4,000 crunches in the past month. Hello. Been on a 500-calorie-a-day diet. Yes, sir. He got buzz and got those ass. No, he didn't. Amen. And so even in natural things, we don't, listen, how many know how to make homemade mashed potatoes? I'm glad to know that. But a lot of folks that don't. They, we mean homemade. I thought they came out of the box. No, nope. homemade mashed potatoes, you got to take them, you got to peel them, you got to boil them, you got to mash them up, you got to add butter, salt. Now, I like to add heavy whipping cream. Yeah. Whoo, glory. If I don't have that, I'll go for half and half. Yes, sir, I like the cream in there. I like, you know, mm, give it some texture, some flavor. Glory to God. Are y'all here? But we got, we got whole generations that, that think that, you know, mashed potatoes come out of a box. Sometimes it's more trouble to make them than it is to make them homemade. Because it could take you a month to get them so they're not like wallpaper paste. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? You keep adding milk, you keep it. If you do it by the recipe, buddy, you can just hang wallpaper when you get done. I guarantee you that. Amen. But being a doer of the work understand that this lifestyle of faith, this lifestyle of confession takes effort on your part. You're going to have to make decisions to be involved in this and to apply and to follow the principles and to do them. They're not going to happen because you got saved. It just doesn't work that way. But he being a, a, a faithful here, continue with their end, being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man, which man? This man shall be blessed in his deed. <laughs> Buddy, I'm going to tell you something. Go on and read this. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion 
and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction and to keep himself. And to keep himself. Didn't say God was going to keep you. He said you keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's religion. I don't believe in religion. Well, James did. Actually said pure religion. Amen. And undefiled before God. So pure and undefiled religion before God is you visit the fatherless and the widows and you keep yourself unspotted. Keep yourself. How do you keep yourself unspotted? Go back up. Whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed. Now the, the, the King James says blessed is deed, the margin says, or his doing. Your doing will be blessed. Feeding on the Word of God, confessing the Word of God, speaking the Word of God, and acting on it. See, confession is the beginning. Your action should be following it. Amen. It's deception to believe that you can just, oh, <laughs> you know, I'm born again. Yeah, I know the Bible said to um, forsake not, but I don't have to assemble myself. I know the Bible said obey, but you know, I've, I've, I've learned from fancy, cool television preacher that uh, I don't have to obey. I also learned from fancy, cool television preacher I don't have to submit. You know, because those are works, and I'm not under the law. I'm free from all that. Well, James said that when you look at the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being a faithful here and a doer of the work. He didn't say word, he said doer of the work. Use the word work, not word. Sometimes we just kind of read over that so fast we don't really catch that. Church. Now, I'm not trying to make you, I'm not trying to put you in captivity and bond. Oh, you know, I'm going to earn my salvation. I'm telling you, if you want success, you're going to have to follow the principles of the Word of God. They just don't happen without you doing what the Bible says. Amen. Okay. Um, and we've quoted this uh, about 25 times or, or along this line. But let's go over to Matthew 12. So we're going to have to get into the perfect law of liberty and do what? Continue therein. And not just be a hearer, but a doer. Amen? But a doer. And he says, the interesting thing that he said there was, well, if you were not a doer of what you heard, you were, decept you were deceived. And there's a lot of deception going on in the church right now. Remember about two years ago, Randy Greer was going around preaching something called the informational church? We, we, we share some of those things about informational church. Coming in January 2011, there'll be a break in the church, and there'll be an informational church, and there will be a spirit-filled or spirit-led church, those who are doing what God told them to do. And he, and he, and he, just, re, he just shared recently that, that the, what the Lord was showing him was what's taking place right now with these, these extreme, this is particularly one extreme teaching. What? It's all information. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to act on anything. What? You're, you're just a hearer of the Word. You're not doing anything. That's a, there's a mindset there. Man, I can just go do, and as a matter of fact, you don't have to do anything the Bible tells you, but you can do anything you want to because your flesh is already covered. That, that's some of the stuff, that's some of the crazy. I don't have to obey the Bible, but I can go fornicate, and that's okay because I'm under grace. Now, you think I'm joking, we had, a, well, I got one of our pastors had a couple come in and actually tell him that to his face. Came in for couple counseling. They were having little relationship problems, and he kind of, from talking to him, found out that they were living together. And he looked at him and just flat out said, don't you think that maybe the reason you're having relationship problems is you're living in sin and fornicating? And they said, oh, no, that don't matter. We're under grace. And you got people saying, I don't have to do what the Bible says, but I can do whatever my flesh wants to do, and I'm still blessed. Well, they weren't blessed. They were having problems. Hello? I said, they weren't blessed, and you're not going to be blessed. You might think you are, but you're not going to be. You might feel good. Let me I tell you, you can feel, people go, people go to concerts and they all feel good when somebody says certain things. Can't we all just live together in harmony? Oh, yes. And sing the Coca-Cola song. Bunch of hippies. Are you here? I'd like to teach the world to sing. And we all get teary-eyed and, you know, this kumbaya and this, uh, you know, oneness of man thing, and, you know, and, and tolerance. You know, we got to tolerate everybody. Coexist. 
coexist bumper stickers on your car. The Muslim and the Christian and the Hindu and the Sikh and all these different things of the world. And we're just to coexist and, you know, we're the brotherhood of man and, and everybody feels good. We sing songs and have, you know, um, we have Christlama services where the Christian and the Muslim come together and worship the same God together. We all feel good. Did you know Jesus did not say go into all the world and hang out with the other religions and just get, sing, sing about good things? He said go preach the gospel to every creature. And then he, he said this, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not will be damned. He did not say that we all going to go to heaven together. He said, that they, he said that those who reject his message will be damned. That's not, that's not a pleasant word. And I'm not cussing in church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, the, the, Jesus said it. All right. Now, how does it become a customer when you start saying I'll be and, you know, using God's name in front of it and all that kind of stuff? And that, that's, that's, that's a, you're, you're pronouncing a curse. That's where it becomes a, a curse word because you've cursed it. Use it to curse something. Jesus said if you don't believe, you'll be damned. He did not say you get to go to heaven. And so we get these ideas that all this, we got all this feel-good stuff going on out there that's not Bible. That's not scriptural. Are you here? Look at Matthew 12 here. And so people are looking, you know, so people are just constantly looking for ways not to do something. And it's, it's just deception. Hallelujah. All right, Matthew chapter 12. Verse 31, Where I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in this world, neither in the one to come. Either make the tree good, the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers and uh, vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance the of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Who said that? The head of the church, the second person of the Godhead, Emmanuel, God with us. Are you here? Jesus? Your words don't matter. Well, Jesus said they do. Hello? If you kind of look at Proverbs 18, 21, this really lines up with what he just said here. Out of the abundance, I mean, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Jesus said, your words are justified, your words are condemned. Come on now. That's just like Proverbs 18, 21. And he didn't say out of God's words you should be justified or out of God's words you'll be condemned. He said by your words. By your words. By your words. Everybody say, by my words. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. Hello? I'm walking in something because God wants me to. No, he said you're going to be condemned and justified by what you say. Stop singing with Doris Day that K Sarah Sarah. Some of y'all are old enough in here to remember that. K Sarah Sarah. Whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see. K Sarah Sarah. Well, that might be a cool, catchy movie tune, but it ain't what you want to be living your life by. Hello. The future is for me to see. God said in his word, he'll show me great and mighty things to come. Amen? Are you here? He said that I'll be condemned or justified by what I say. I can determine my destiny by the words that come out of my mouth. You can determine your destiny by the words that come out of your mouth. We can determine our church's destiny by the words that come out of our mouth. 
Instead of getting together in groups and going, well, I don't know why this isn't happening. Shut up and say our church is going. Church is happening. Things are great. God's moving. Hallelujah. We're growing. God's bringing people in. From the, I mean, say, speak faith. Yes. Are y'all here? You're going home. That got real country sounding, didn't it? Y'all here? <laughs> Hallelujah. Every once in a while, I just kind of uh, regress right over to Eastern Carolina, where I, you know, where I'm from. I'm from a small town called Aden. Hallelujah. Yep, Aden, North Carolina. And uh, you think I have an accent now? You should have heard me back then. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Look, verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure bringeth forth good things. The right, let's, let's, let's take this over to, to post-resurrection. The righteous man out of a righteous treasure will bring forth good things. If you're not, Jesus said, if you're not speaking the right things, it's because you don't have the right thing in you. What's in you is what's going to come out. What's in you? I said, what's in you? Bible or your opinion? People make stuff up, say God said it. They do. You know, they get to thinking, and they find something they like, and they can latch onto, and they go and tell everybody God told them. I knew a guy one time. Actually, he was here at the church when we first got here. And uh, he supposedly got saved because at first... At first, he used to tell everybody that an angel had appeared to him, and he got saved. Then somebody in the church who, who was, I, I don't want to be kind, who was squirrelier than anybody I've ever met. I mean, he's like, he looked like Ka when he talked to you. The Lord told me to do this this way. We had a podium we built. And it was going to be, and when they got to the raw finish part before the stain and stuff, it was it was really nice looking. I said, "Great, let's do it in dark walnut. Do the whole thing, you know, like special walnut, you know, with a with a satin finish." I come in, it's done in a light finish everywhere except the top and the cross on the front, and it's done in this high gloss finish. And he goes, "The Lord told me to do it this way." No, he didn't. I'm the pastor. I'm the one preaching. God don't really care if I've got a satin finish, special walnut, or a, a two-tone finish. You just, cut, you just dreamed up and said, God told you. Hello? Well, he told this guy who got saved, supposedly, because he had a vision of an angel, that it wasn't an angel. The Lord said it wasn't an angel. It was Jesus. So he changed his testimony. Let me tell you something, honey. If you've seen Jesus, you don't have to anybody tell you. You do not have to have somebody come with a revelation that it wasn't an angel, it was Jesus, if you've seen Jesus. Are y'all here? You're going home. You don't have to wonder. There are certain things that are real clear. The, 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 the nail prints in his hand and the nail prints in his feet. Are you here? That's enough to figure it out. Angels don't have that. Dear Lord. How did I get off on that? Uh, I don't know, but it was just there. Oh, making stuff up. People just make stuff up. And they say to the Lord, now let me tell you something. How do you know if you're walking according to the plan of God? Right here. The Lord told me to do such and such. Well, what does the Bible say? The Lord told me I didn't have to go to church. Oh, really? The Lord told you not to go to church. Then, then please tell me it says he's the Lord who changes not. The forever, O Lord, his word is settled in heaven. Not one, not one jot, nor not one tittle shall pass away. Are you here? Are you here? How is it that he said, don't forsake your assembling? And they told you, you didn't have to go. We are to be submitted to the Word of God and put it in our heart. I know we're, we're pounding on this today, but I'm telling you, we've got to, we've got to arrest ourselves in the world, I mean, in, in, in the church world as a whole, in this church, we have to arrest ourselves so that the Bible becomes the authority in our life. We're not the authority of the Bible. The Bible is the authority of us. Um, a friend of mine posted on Facebook the other day, 
It said, it said when, we, when we don't submit to the Word of God, when we question the authority of the Word of God, we become the judge of the Word instead of the Word judging us. And it's got some other things that are really good. I should have brought my phone out here so I could, I could, I could pull that particular quote up. You know, in other words, no matter what we do, no matter how we look at it, we are the authority over the Word instead of it it's being our authority. You have to approach this that this is the authority of your life. That you say what it says, you do what it says, you obey what it says. That's why there's such a strong push. I, let me tell you something. In the past couple of years, there's been people coming out saying, well, we don't need the written word. It's, it's good. I read it. But we need the indwelling Holy Ghost. Now, all that does is set people up for a goosebump and be their guide. Because the majority of the church isn't mature enough to not have a Bible in the first place. Actually, I don't think you can get there. Are you here? You, the written word was given to be a guide, to be a light unto your path and a lamp unto your feet. It was given to be the thing that, that was the authority in your life that kept you on the right track. That imparted into you wisdom and knowledge. We, don't just, we just need the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm led by the Spirit. Yeah, I read the Bible. It's a good thing to do. What have you done? You set yourself up and you're setting other people up that whenever you know, somebody preaches what the Bible says, they come and go, yeah, but the Lord told me. I got a revelation. You got a revelation that's, that's more powerful or more revealing than what the Word of God says. It's not from heaven. Amen. Amen. See, a lot, of, a lot of Word of Faith Pentecostals or Word of Faith Charismatics think that they got a, they got a corner on stuff. I'm going to tell you something. There's, you got Baptists who are, who are as much and, or as more adamant about following the Scriptures than Pentecostals are or Word of Faith people or Charismatics. We call ourselves Word people. And, they, and they'll do what the Bible says. Thank God for them. Amen. Are you here? I appreciate them. I appreciate the fact that they're sticklers for the Word. Now, they're walking in the light that they have. And we can walk in the light that we have. But, we, our light is still, if, but if our light is different than the Bible, it's not light from heaven. Just be bobbleheads and shake your head up and down and say yes. Amen. I'm going to get Pastor Ed we're going to, One of these days we're going to have Pastor Ed Bobblehead doll. And you're going to put it in the back of your car and say, Pastor Ed said follow the word. And you just, yeah, <laughs> riding down the road. Amen. And that, wouldn't that be cool to have Pastor Ed bobbleheads? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> it, it, no, it's not. Is this 735? Next Sunday, we're going to talk about how to hold fast. <laughs> it got away from me. Praise the Lord. Do we under, are we getting to the place we understand? Do we understand the, the, the imperativeness of feeding on the Word, speaking the Word, living according to the Word? Not, not to our feeling, not to our goosebumps. Um, like I said, some of our charismatics have given us a bad, our, our, our Word of Faith charismatics have given us a bad thing because they, they just went off after, they, they, they start, where they usually start is they stop doing the Word. And they, oh, I'm being led by the Spirit. And what usually means is they're led by a, 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 a whim, a, a feeling. They get a goose bump. Or as they said in Balto, people bumps. Y'all have ever seen Balto? The goose, he got people bumps. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost hit in, hit, hit, hit in a goose bump or a, a, a feeling or your hair standing up. He will lead you. The Spirit and the Word are in agreement. The Holy Ghost walks in line with, as the third person of the Godhead. Now remember Jesus said this. I know I'm going a little bit longer, but hold on. Jesus said, I only do those things which I see my Father do. In other words, the second person of the Godhead was submitted to the will of the first person of the Godhead, the Father. And the Holy Ghost will come, and he will teach you what? Whatsoever things I have, oh Lord, commanded you. Cussing in church again. Commandments. Sounds like law. Isn't that funny? Jesus said the Holy Ghost is going to come in the new dispensation to teach you what I taught you. 
So then what Jesus said must have relevance, hadn't it? I was under the old covenant. But he said the Holy Ghost is going to teach you what I said. So if you just read your whole Bible, you won't get weird. Kids can't leave the, you can't leave the parts out that just don't line up with what you like. Amen. The Holy Spirit, he'll show you, he'll teach you what sort of things I said. What? The third person of the Godhead is submitted to the will of the first and the second person of the Godhead. The Holy Ghost does not have his own mission. His mission is to reinforce and to proclaim whatever the first or second person of the Godhead's will is. And the second person is, is, is the same thing as the first person's. In other words, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost work in harmony together to carry out the plan and purpose of God. And it's always consistent. You don't have the Holy Ghost over here going, well, I know that the Bible says, but you don't have to do it. Because I'm the Holy Ghost, and we're under my dispensation. You can do what you want to do. It don't work that way. I said, it doesn't work that way. Victory, success, prosperity, blessings lie in feeding and meditating and confessing and doing what the Word says. Not what someone tells you you don't have to do. Why don't we just stop telling people what they don't have to do and start telling what the Bible says for them to do? Amen. You know why? Because people want some instant blessings. They want to put some water on the stove, throw some butter in there, some salt in there, and pour some flakes, white flakes in there. In about five minutes after it comes to a boil, and stir it up and have instant mashed potatoes. They don't want to do any effort. Better than that, they want to go to the store and buy the package you stick in the microwave and, and turn that on for three minutes and just dump them out and they're already done. They make those too. In the, in the freezer or, or cooler section, they got potatoes that are already mashed and made. You just tear the top off and, and put, open it up, put it in the microwave, then dump them out. You got, you, you're talking about instant mashed potatoes. Done made mashed potatoes. Y'all here? Then your family all goes. Let's be doers of the Word. Let's meditate in the Word. Let's act on the Word. Amen? Can you, can you agree with me on that? Next Sunday, we'll teach you how to hold fast. Hallelujah. Amen. We'll, te we'll teach you talk on that next Sunday morning. All right. Let's receive our offering. Glory to God. And if you're watching by the internet and want to be involved in giving, just go to our website, www.fbc.org. Click on the online giving tab. You can go through PayPal and use a PayPal account. And uh, you can give that way or you can, you can mail something if you wanted to do that. Just, just if you want to be involved, we appreciate it. God bless you. And the, the blessings of, of the tither and the giver be on you too. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, the giver, you be given here. Amen. Ready? Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the people who tithe and give right now. We call blessings upon them. We thank you that the Word of God is released in their behalf. We thank you that, that you do exactly what you said you would do in your Word, and the blessings overtake them now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.